17, just because they're a segue into where I want to go with verse 18 to the close of the chapter, in verse number 25. So you may bear with me just a little bit, but remember uh, that so far in the book of 1 Peter, what we have seen to this point is that uh, Peter is really enamored with the gospel. And he's really enamored with what we are in Christ Jesus because of the gospel's work. And uh, I think it's why I like 1 Peter so much. Uh, because I like to talk about the gospel. I like to talk about the ramifications of the gospel. I like to see the gospel at work in people's lives. And you'll recall that in the midst of all this persecution, this suffering, these trials that these people are going through, Peter basically opens up by saying, don't forget you are a special people. Um, you're a royal priesthood. You are not just everyday, ordinary citizens. You're God's people. You're citizens of a greater country, and that is heaven itself. And, uh, and then he began to talk about the ramifications of that, and he talks about how these ramifications go beyond eternity into the present. That is, that you and I, because we are a different people, we're to act differently in this world. Um, even when that's difficult, even when that's not easy, even when the government is not doing what it should be doing, even when wrong seems to be blessed and right seems to be cursed, uh, it's our responsibility as God's people to be a holy people. And uh, I don't know if I said this or not earlier, a few weeks back, but if I did, you don't remember it anyway. Um, so let me say it like this tonight. Holiness is what we're called to uh, in 1 Peter, you know. Uh, as God's people, we're called to holiness. And each and every one of us in this room understands that we are not holy tonight. We're not perfect people. We've been declared righteous by the work of Christ, but we have not yet attained righteousness. We're not yet there holy. Um, and I wish we were. And uh, some of you are uh, a lot holier than me, and, uh, and we like those people, right? When we get around them, we can feel the Spirit of God, the presence of God on their lives, their holiness radiates. We, we like them until they convict us of our holiness, <laughs> of our unholiness, right? Uh, in fact, I was given Brother Dean a hard time in Sunday school a few weeks back before we went on this trip about we were in India, and Brother Dean is just a holy fella, and we're sitting having breakfast, and I made a comment about watching the Big Bang Theory, and Dean, I thought, was going to fall out of his chair. I mean, he says, you would watch that show, you know? And I went, no. no. <laughs> Some other people in my home have seen that show, and I, I, I think they are to terribly unrighteous, you know? And let's deem you and I together go get them, you know what I mean? And uh, we like holiness in other people, and we like holiness in ourselves, until those moments when we start to realize just how really unholy we are, right? And then it gets to be pretty convicting. Uh, but I think the best thing we can know about holiness in this life is that holiness is measured in two ways. First of all, measuredness is ho measured, or I'm sorry, holiness is measured in our application of the Word of God. I really believe that. I believe that today, if you want to know whether or not you're gaining holiness in your life, look at how you're applying the Word. And I'm not asking you if you made any mistakes today. I'm asking you if you spent time in the Word and you figured out a way to make it personal to you and to, to take its precepts and statutes and to apply them to your life. And the second thing is that holiness is measured in our living, our conduct, and our loving toward other people. It's not only effective of how we see the Word applied to us, but it's also uh, in measured by how we see it applied to other people, in other words. Uh, are we willing to take what we're applying to ourselves and apply it to other uh, people? And so that's really where Peter is at in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. He's talking about holiness, and he's using a specific conversation piece, and that is the government itself. And you learned about this last week in verses 13 to 17. Bear with me a couple of moments. There Peter writes, Be subject for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. So he's been speaking on holiness, and he continues on that by speaking about our conduct with other people. And I think his words are particularly interesting, both in the setting in which they're written and also in our setting today, right? 
Because during the time that Peter is writing these words, Rome is violently and passionately pursuing the lives uh, of Christian people and the destruction of the Christian faith uh, at every corner. Many people are dying for their faith on a regular basis. This was not something that they talked about. It wasn't something that they heard about was taking place. This was something they were experiencing in their personal lives. They were experiencing death around them. And the people, if they had lived in this day, may have thought to themselves, when is the preacher ever going to preach a sermon about concealed carry, right? Mm -hmm. When is he ever going to preach a sermon about defending ourselves? When is he ever going to preach a sermon about, and by the way, I'm a big proponent of concealed carry, but uh, when is he ever going to talk about how we are to rise up and to have a militia against these people? And yet, that's not what Peter addresses with them. Instead, what he does is he commits to his readers advice, which may have been troubling to them, uh, but he basically tells them to do nothing. He tells them to honor everyone, to love the brotherhood, to fear God, and to honor the emperor. I shouldn't say that he says to do nothing, because he tells them to do these things, which were, in fact, the most difficult of all to do in that moment, right? Not only this, but he tells them that they're to be doing good in the midst of evil. In our time, it would be naive for a moment to assume that most of the people in this room are happy with the present political environment. Is that fair? It would be naive to say that everybody in this room is happy with how things are going. There's all kinds of conversations going on around the United States, especially in an election year, wondering how we're going to go about handling the situations this nation faces. Now, even people who are of a different political persuasion than I am are wondering, what are we going to do? You know, What do we do when Iran takes our soldiers captive and gives them free, and our leaders thank them, uh, while at the same time on the other side of the world they're showing pictures bragging about it. Uh, what do we do when the safety of a citizenship is in question? What do we do when we value life uh, in, in, the, in the measure of, of gun loss, but we will not value life in the measure of the unborn? Uh, what do we do in such a political climate? But listen to what Peter says about this emperor and how these people were to respond to their government. He says that the government basically has two responsibilities, and I think you can these transcend time. He says that this government, this emperor, has the responsibility to two things. Number one, he is to punish evil. That is, he's to vanquish it, he's to get rid of it, he's to seek it out, he's to find the wrong, and he's to get rid of it. That's why we believe in capital punishment, because it's the government's responsibility to bear the sword of the Lord on behalf of the citizenship, to punish evil. Second of all, uh, and by the way, for a further discussion on that, we're going to talk about capital punishment in our Sanctity of Life sermon this week, so you want to come be a part of that. Second thing they're supposed to do is to praise God, uh, or praise good, rather. They're to, to make sure that when good things happen, the government is supposed to be saying, uh, good job, and to re reinforce those things. Now, obviously, as Peter writes these words to these people, they must have thought to themselves, but our government isn't doing that. Our government isn't punishing evil, that's not vanquishing evil, uh, it's promoting evil, right? <laughs> it's not promoting good, it's not praising good, it's, it's promoting evil. Uh, so what do you do in the midst of that? And the reality is that that hasn't changed today, right? You and I look around the room and we say, why is it that it seems to us as Christian believers that the government is promoting evil and punishing good? Why do we live in such a day. And the reality is those people were right and you are right today. The reality is uh, that Peter says, however, that his view on our instruction and our, and our conversation and our dealings with the government, that God's word doesn't change. Just because we don't agree, we still call to honor people, to love our enemies, right? To honor everyone, to love the brotherhood, to fear God and to honor the emperor no matter how difficult it may seem at those times. Because while you and I cannot control what the government does tonight, and neither could these people, what we can do is we can control our own actions or reactions to it. Uh, he says that they, we are to do good to put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. As the church, these people and we are commanded to do the same no matter what the political environment is. We are to live righteously that our actions might overcome the evil words of the people around us. Uh, by the way, an interesting side note on this, I've been reading an article about millennials, and you know who the, the millennial people are, right? They're the people born 1990 or after, and that's, 
the group that every political group wants to catch, uh, right? And it's the group that every church is trying to catch. Um, they say, we've got to reach the millennials. This is the age group that's leaving church, you know? And an interesting article I read about it was talking about how we reach millennials, and it said that the church, churches with many millennials in them have realized that they offer um, social justice programs. That is, that for whatever reason, that generation is really concerned about not seeing justice played out in our world. And uh, I think that's interesting. I think that's interesting. You know why I think it's interesting? It's because the church agrees with the millennials on this issue. And we do not see justice prevailing either. And we have a great opportunity to reach those people through that opportunity, through that, through that avenue. Their, their heartbeat, that group, that generation apparently, is to seek justice. Now, that can go down the wrong road with what's called the, you know, uh, the justice gospel or the social gospel. Um, the gospel doesn't change. That Jesus came and he lived. He died our death on the cross of Calvary. He was buried in the cold tomb. He was raised to the glory of God. And if you believe in him, you're given the right to be called the child of God. The gospel never changes. You cannot moralize a society, which the social, social gospel tries to do. It tries to say we can just legislate people into doing the right things. But millennials, we have an opportunity, church, to reach them by saying, hey, we want the same end. We want justice. But here's the deal. You can't get justice the way you're trying to get it. We can bring about justice through the gospel. So anyway, just a side note, a rabbit to be chased. Second of all, Peter tells them not only are you to live good lives so that the ignorance of foolish people is, is, is stopped. He says that we are also to live as free people. And all the Americans said, amen, we're excited about this, right? We like freedom, right? Like Braveheart, uh, give me freedom, right? This is because we understand, uh, Peter, in Peter's view, that there is a real judge out there who judges between right and wrong. And that's going to come full circle as we get into eight, verses 18 and following tonight. Uh, but we understand that God is the real judge, and so Peter is making the argument that we live in freedom because of that. In other words, we are not bound by the constraints uh, that are around us because we live in freedom. We know that God will judge us one day, right? Um, but we're not to use that freedom as an opportunity to do evil, but as an opportunity to do good. And 30 tells them in a sweeping finale finale to honor everyone, that is, no matter their goodness, their ethnicity, their religion, or anything else. Love the brotherhood. As we go through trials, we fall more in love with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Fear God. Recognize that there's an ultimate authority, supreme authority in our lives. And finally, that we are to honor the emperor, that is, to give him respect. And we would say in American culture, to honor the president, the congress, and so on and so forth, and to give them the ultimate respect. Saw a picture on Facebook last week of a, I think he was a World War II veteran in a wheelchair and the president came by and, and I thought it was such a moving picture and he was trying to stand up and the president said, you don't need to stand up and he says, no sir, I do. You're the president of the United States of America. Um, you may not agree with his policies and I'm as guilty as anybody in this matter, but at the end of the day, he is our president appointed by God. Um, even though I don't know what God was thinking, appointed by God, <laughs> And it's my responsibility to honor him, to respect him. I want to share with you a quick story. Can I do that? I like history. I hope you like it as well. Does anybody know what the first flag that was flown over uh, the American colony troops was in the American Revolution? Anybody ever heard this story? Any history professors in here? It was called the Appeal to Heaven flag. And this is one thing you'll not be told in American history. It was christened by George Washington to fly over the only seven American ships that we owned at the time, the colony ships that we owned at the time. And it's just a simple white flag, and it has a little green cedar tree on it, and it had the words, Appeal to Heaven, across the top of it. And the inspiration that George Washington found from that was the words of a famous philosopher by the name of John Locke, who wrote in his two treatises on governments the following words. And I want you to hear these. Listen closely. I know it's old English, but hang with me. John Locke wrote, What is my remedy against a robber that so broke into my house? Appeal to the law for justice, they say. But perhaps justice is denied, or I am crippled and I cannot stir. Robbed and have no means to do it. If God has taken away all means of seeking remedy, there is nothing left but patience. John Locke said, what am I supposed to do when justice is denied to me? 
but sit around and have patience. He says, But for my son, when Abel may seek the relief of the law which I was denied, he or his son may renew his appeal till he recover that right. In other words, I may not even see justice in my lifetime. Maybe my son or my, my grandson will do that. Listen to this. But the conquered or their children have no court, no arbitrator on earth to appeal to. Then they may appeal as Jephthah did to heaven and repeal, repeat their appeal till they have recovered the native right of their ancestors, which was to have such a legislative over them as the majority should approve and freely acquiesce in. People don't talk like that anymore, but you know what John Locke said? He said, when you have sought the end of all the appeals known to man, and justice has been denied to you, you have but one last appeal to go, and that is an appeal to the supreme God, in whom's legislature we can act with us. What a marvelous thought. And George Washington was so moved by these words that in 1765, October the 20th, I believe it was, 1765, he christened the very first flag, the flag of the American colonies who were fighting, the colonists who were fighting, this flag, a white flag with a green cedar tree with the words, appeal to heaven, Christ. Letting everyone know that they believed that this war that had been brought to the American colonies was a righteous war in which they were appealing to the Supreme God uh, to, to fight their cause for. Interesting, isn't it? I think that comes in the spirit of Peter's words. Uh, tonight, as he says, that we are to respect the emperor. You know, go ahead. He, he mentioned it, but, but in the 17 there, it says, Men love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. All those words, honor, love, uh, fear, and honor again, can all be added, just nouns. But these are all active verbs. That's right, they are. That's good. That's, good. That's right. Okay, let's not stop there. Let's pick it up in verse 18. I'm going to go really fast. Verse 18, he says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the, uh, to the unjust. Excuse me. We don't live in a world of slavery today like Peter knew, but the principle is unchanging, right? We might speak in the same manner that he's speaking of masters here as our boss, as our employer, as our manager, whatever we want to talk about. And he says that we are to subject ourselves to those authorities. That little word, subject, means that we put ourselves under their authority. doesn't mean we always agree with them. doesn't mean um, that they're always right. It means that we put ourselves under their authority. And he says that we are to do so, catch this, with all respect. All respect means that there's not going to be backbiting. There's not going to be talking uh, uh, evilly behind their back. But rather, we're going to do so uh, with all respect. That means we're going to give them... The honor that is due the position, regardless of whether or not they deserve that honor at all. In fact, uh, this is what my grandfather tried to teach me growing up. He would oftentimes say uh, to me, the boss may not always be right, but the boss is still the boss. Uh, wherever you go to work, the boss may not always be right, but the boss is still the boss. He's still the one who you're supposed to put yourself under their authority. Peter goes to great lengths in this moment to deal with every type of master, every type of boss. He says that we are to subject ourselves to them with all respect, without any backbiting. He says, not only to the good, those are the ones that it's easy. Well, maybe not, because even the good ones sometimes get our dander up. But also, he says, even uh, to the unjust. Not only to the gentle, but to the unjust. In other words, he says to these slaves, he says, uh, as you're a slave of Christ, for, first and foremost, that you are to put yourself in subjection to those who rule over you. Uh, whether they rule over you rightly, fairly, gently, good, or any other way, you are to put yourself under their authority with all respect. Verse 19 and 20. For this is a gracious thing. That, what is this? This is that putting ourselves in, in subjection, right, to those uh, rulers, to those authorities. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Notice what he says here. First of all, he says that we are to be mindful of God in such circumstances, right? Over and over again, he's been reminding us in these first two chapters that, our, that, our, that God is our ultimate judge. So he's saying again one more time in this moment, 
Be mindful of God, what God is doing in this, even if you don't understand, even if you don't see it. Be mindful of what God is doing. And second, he compares our suffering to the suffering of the gospel. He says, it is a gracious thing. And then he closes with, it is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So he's drawing a clear line uh, of distinction here. And he's saying that when you suffer, because you have done the right things, when you have subjected yourself to the authority, even if they were unjust, and it seemed like that authority was praised and prevailed and, and, uh, and injustice uh, was, was promoted, even in such moments, be mindful of God. Set your, your mind on the great supreme judge and forget the rest of that. Remember that there's one who's greater, who's supreme, who has all authority, and ultimately you do this because you are living out the gospel. You're living out what happened to Christ. You're living out what went on in his life. It's a gracious thing. In fact, he says that some suffer because of sin. And, and think about that for a moment. That's not even suffering. Let's take that word out of the vocabulary. If you do these things and there's a consequence to them, then you can't really say in that moment, well, that's not fair, right? That's, that, that shouldn't have happened. If you, if you, if you shoot somebody, uh, I still want you to find Christ, but there's still a penalty to be paid for that crime, right? You can't remove the penalty sometimes, the consequence. Sometimes, and I'm so thankful for God and God's marvelous court, He removes the penalty because He put it on His Son, Jesus, you know? Uh, he didn't actually remove it. He placed it on Christ. It, justice had to prevail. The cross is where the love and justice of God met face to face. But in this world, sometimes there is suffering as a direct result of the, of the choices that have been made. And we've all experienced Christians like this, right? You, they, 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 they make a decision which is wrong, which is sinful, and then consequences come on them. And they call the prayer group together, right? And they say, boy, I need you to pray for me. I'm going through these difficult things right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm really suffering. And there's a part of me that gets a little bit cold and calloused. I shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that way. I should in that moment say, well, I'm going to pray for you, but you need to understand that this is exactly the antithesis of what Peter was saying here in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Because in such moments, we lose our testimony. When, when I say I'm suffering, but really I'm just bearing out the consequences of bad decisions, and I say to people, I'm suffering for the sake of Christ, they go, well, what kind of Christ is that? So on the other hand, he puts it in contrast with those who suffer being mindful of a supreme God who have done nothing wrong. And yet, suffering and sorrow come along their way, right? And he says, when you do good and you suffer, verse number 24, and you endure, that word speaks of a patience, of a willingness to get through it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Really? It's gracious for me to suffer having not done anything wrong? Really? Is this really what God would teach us? Well, how does it compare to the gospel? Pick it up in verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, Leaving you an example. This is why I say he's drawing it all back to the gospel. So that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. But his wounds you have been healed. For you were strained like sheep, but now have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Notice in verse number 21, he says, to this you have been called. You know what that word called means? It means to be given a grand opportunity, or to be given a grand uh, purpose. That's why we use the term calling on people, right? What's your calling in life? What is that grand purpose that you were created for? And we know that all of us have the purpose of being created uh, for the glory of God. But then we start talking about what is that specific calling, right? What is that uh, grand purpose by which you were created? Whether it be preaching, whether it be pastoring, whether it be a role in evangelist, a missionary, a doctor, an oncology director, a teacher, uh, whatever it is. What's that grand purpose that God has created you for or that specific purpose to use you? And Peter says in this moment, to you, you or to this, you have been called. 
to suffering, he writes to the church. Now, that's not very encouraging, right? I'm thinking that Peter could have found some better words to use here, right? In the midst of a church that's losing life, limb, property, and all that they have, treasures and families, and he, in, in, in this moment, Peter says, you've got to honor the emperor, and by the way, you were given this grand purpose. And I'm thinking, great, how lucky am I, right? This is not right. Give me some other great grand purpose in my life. Give me something else. But listen to this. He says, for this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you. And then he says, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. What a thought. He says, you have been called to this grand purpose, this grand uh, 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 thing in your life, this grand end in your life, to suffer for doing what is good because it gives you the opportunity to follow in the steps of Christ. By the way, Peter had learned this lesson from the very mouth of Jesus himself. Jesus had said to those who wanted to follow him, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow after me. You can't just decide you want to go and do what you want to do. You've got to forsake and you've got to come after me. You've got to suffer. There's a man who wanted to bury his dad. It seems like a reasonable request. When Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead, you come follow me. Another man that wanted to put some affairs in order, and he says, don't worry about that. Come follow me. The point of the gospel, beloved, is missed oftentimes in our society. We live in a society where health and wealth is preached on a regular basis. And don't misunderstand me. I want you to know very clearly tonight that God does not intend to see you uh, labor in vain. You know, I think this was the message that Jesus uh, portrayed to his disciples. When he said to them, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough current concerns of its own. Look at how the Father clothes the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. Will he not do the same for you? Uh, God is going to take care of his people. The psalmist said, I think it's in Psalm 71, that he'd, or, uh, that he'd never seen the, the, the righteous forsaken or hungry or searching for bread. When I talk about health and wealth preaching, I'm talking about the type of preaching that says, here's how you live life as a Christian. You believe in Christ, you get everything that you want, no hell, you die in peace, and life is good. Beloved, that is not the call of Christ that these men and women saw. What they saw was a life of turmoil. <coughs> they saw a life of suffering. They saw a life of pain. They saw a life that modeled in the footsteps of Christ, and they were glad to do it. Now here's the part that gets us in trouble. Beloved, this is the same life that you and I are called to today. God did not promise any one of us in this room that life was going to always be easy or that it was always going to be good. Or that you'd always have everything that you wanted. What he promised to us is that he would take care of us. That he would give us life of abundance. That abundance doesn't mean you're always going to have lots of money in the bank account. It doesn't always mean that your kids are always going to be healthy. What it means is that he's going to give you life of satisfaction, contentment, filled with joy and peace and comfort. And this you see modeled in strong believers, right? I think of Miss uh, Ruth when Brother Norman Noble passed away this last year going to the funeral. And watching her sit up there as men, men, man after man got up to talk about the great impact her husband had on their ministry and their life. And she sat there with a smile on her face just over and over again. Not a tear fell from her cheek, just... Just a smile on her face the whole time. That joy, that contentment, that peace, that comfort. That's life of abundance. It's something that the world can't offer to us. The call of the cross is not a call to come and look at a Savior who's dying on our behalf. It's a call to come and to die with Him. To pick up our cross and to be crucified with Him. Obviously, I don't mean by that in any way that you can pay a penalty for your own sin. What I mean by that is exactly what Jesus meant. That is that if you want to come after me, you've got to be willing to take on my crown of thorns. You've got to be willing to take on my cross. You've got to be willing to follow in my footsteps. You've got to be willing to take on the suffering. Because if you do right, it's not always going to go well with you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a police officer in our midst tonight. He's going to tell us about how it always goes well when he's trying to enforce the law, right? <laughs> Every person he ever pulls over says, I'm so glad you pulled me over because I was breaking the law. Right? I know that's what I do when I get pulled over. Miss Eunice, you've been pulled over a little more than me. Is that what you do? <laughs> By Darren, right? <laughs> ah, okay, all right, now we're getting there. Let's confess some sin, all right? Uh, no, no. When you do what is right, you 
you always put yourself in harm's way. By the way, I like how God kind of pulls things together sometimes. I really was thinking about this last week, and, and I wish uh, that I had been able to teach last week and kind of pull this all together. But I was thinking about the Lefevers, for example, <clears throat> taking in this young man, trying to do the right thing, and all the turmoil that now they will have to deal with for years. Um, having had the, that tragic event happen uh, at their home is now a burden that they have to carry. And why do they have to carry that? Because they did what was right. They did what was good. They did what was honorable. They did what was noble. Well, doing the right thing doesn't mean that life is just going to get good. It means, in fact, really many times quite the opposite. Uh, it means that people are going to disrespect you. They're going to talk bad about you. Peter says that Jesus left this example for us. He committed no sin, not with his actions and not with his mouth. Think about that thought for a moment. How did he do that? When he was reviled, he did not return it. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Instead, he continued, he says, to entrust himself to the one who judges justly. That word there, entrust in the Greek, it means to place one's life, hope, ambition, or all of the human condition into something. He says that he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. We see this played out, don't we? On the cross, Jesus said the following words. He said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Here, you, you, here I am. I am pouring out. I am laying it all out in front of you. Jesus trusted everything that he was and all that had happened to the one true judge, the Father. And ours is to follow in his example, not to try and seek justice in this life where none can be found. Don't misunderstand me. I want justice. I, I want to encourage others to, to seek justice. I want to... Seek after leaders who will pursue justice, okay? But at the end of the day, justice will not be found in this life. You're always going to be let down. That's why I like Locke's words so much, because he says, you know, at the end of the day, he says, what do you do when the, when the court fails you? It fails your son and your grandson and all those things. You've only got one last recourse for that justice. And where will that be? The appeal to heaven. And that's what Peter's saying in this moment, that Jesus set this example that he entrusted himself, all that he was, into the care of a God who judges all things, to the Father himself. And we are to do the same thing. We entrust our lives into his care. Not to try to always prove that we're right. Boy, that's a hard one for me, by the way. Whenever I think I'm right and somebody thinks I'm wrong, I really spend a lot of time showing them how wrong they are. You know what I mean? I know none of you can relate to that, but that's my natural... Uh, uh, reaction is to say you are wrong. Just give me enough time and I'll prove it to you. And by the way, I never do. Um, but they never proved to me they're right either, so there you go. Uh, but to entrust all that we are to the Father, right? To entrust all that we are to the Father who knows all things and judges all things rightly or justly, he says. And we do all this all because of the gospel. Peter says he bore our sin on the cross, or on that tree. So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Well, that's a great phrase as well. He says that we have a great hope not only in the life to come, but in this life right here, right? That we might not only have righteousness in the world to come, but that we have a righteousness here. That we might die to sin. Uh, what a great thought. That we can begin to die to sin. I can be less sinful today than I was yesterday. Uh, and that's our ambition, right? To be more like Christ today than I was yesterday. And then he says, we were all like sheep, but his, by his wounds we were healed. In other words, he has brought us back into the fold of God. So let me give you a conclusion, and I'll open it up for your thoughts. Uh, like so much of the Bible, this is not a very difficult passage to understand. It's just a difficult passage to apply. Uh, it's not hard to know what Peter's saying in such moments. It's not hard to understand what he would have us to do with our current political environments. It's not hard to understand what we're supposed to do uh, in much of life. But the reality is, what's hard is being able to actually execute. <laughs> right? This is like, uh, I'm going to tell a story on Miss Annie. You know, we're preparing for the next tournament at golf, right? And we're working on things. And we're out there on the driving range. And we do them over and over again. And they just, they get to where they seem to be secondhand. And we get on the first tee and we forget it all. Right? And the coach walks up and says, hey, remember, get your hand on the inside of the plane, come, uh, come through and turn your wrist over. And she says, I know, I know. 
leave me alone. You know, get out of the way. I know what I'm doing. The problem is not a knowledge. And Mom laughs because she's seen it firsthand. Uh, it's not a knowledge issue. The issue is <coughs> I've got to take it from the practice tee to the golf course. Right? I've got to take it from over here at church where we called the play to actually putting it in practice. That's the difficulty. When we feel that we are unjustly persecuted in specific, when we feel like we are suffering, we so oftentimes want to kind of gather the church troops together, right? Prepare for battle. This happens in church all the time. I've been wrong. What's my natural reaction? Well, I'm going to get John Wilma on the phone. I'm going to get Gary Creek on the phone. I'm going to get Jim and Darlene on the phone. And I'm going to let them know how evil and hostile Arlene is toward me. And we <laughs> together are going to go and confront this issue and show her how terrible she is. That's our natural reaction. When we feel we've been wrong, it's our natural reaction to get everybody else on our side to come in there and say, you've you got to get this t taken care of. But Peter says, you, beloved, have a much greater calling than you have a calling where you are a special people, a holy people. You have a calling on your life where it's okay to suffer from time to time because you have a supreme judge over you who knows right and wrong. And by the way, sometimes I thought I was suffering and I was in the right and I was wrong. He knew more than I did. Now I know. That's hard for us to wrap our minds around, but sometimes God knows what we do not know. And sometimes it takes time for us to come to that understanding. Sometimes we never do. But the reality is that we entrust our lives into the care of God because we believe that He is the just one who will right these wrongs. When you suffer unjustly, you are bearing out the marks of Christ in your body. You're being called to that great and glorious calling. The greatest calling there is. That's why when Peter was to be crucified, he said that he, did, he was fine with that. He just didn't want to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. He wanted to be crucified and put down. He got called to the greatest call, to die for Jesus. The funny thing is, we all know this, right? We hear Rashid's story. We hear Nick Ripkin or whoever talk about these Somalian refugees who are dying for the faith <laughs> in Christ. And we say, man, how cool. But I wonder if we'd have the same reaction. If it was us. If it was our neck on the line. You know? I walk away from a meeting with Krushi. We just had a conference call the other day, by the way, so I'm a little bit excited. We have this conference call. You hear his voice. You hear him talk. And, and you walk away and you go, man, this is so cool. I wish I could be a Green Beret Christian. Send me over there. I'll live dangerously for Jesus. But to those guys, this is just lie. This is lie. Nothing cool about it. They'd like to come live here. No wonder James says that we are to consider it all joy when we encounter various trials because we're like Jesus in such a moment. We do this through the entrusting of our souls, that is, recognizing that we indeed are not in control of our own destinies, but God is. And that one day God will make right every wrong. How do we accomplish that task? Well, for Peter and for us, it must be always through the gospel. The gospel, the gospel work of Christ. What Jesus has done on our behalf is he's out of the business of changing us. Alright, thoughts, corrections, additions,